So welcome everybody. And uh, before we start today's meeting, there's a pleasant task that we all would like to do. I'd like to invite the birthday baby, Radhi Neelakantan. <laughs> Please, happy birthday. Come, Radhi. Radhi. <laughs> Come. <laughs> Very, very quick uh, speech here. Yeah? Well, I expected nothing less from the Duchess Fi and trust Nina to come up with surprises. Thank you so much and thank you all for your wishes. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Rati, remember you still have to do those 51 trips? Yeah. yeah. yeah? <laughs> My target for Rati is 100 trips. She's halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Anuka. Yeah. Let me just get you to your... It's okay. So ladies, a very warm welcome to all our members and our guest speakers for today. It indeed is a pleasure to have Aditi Krishna Kumar, the author of that year at Mani Koel, and Lubaina Bandhu Kuala, author of the Chopati Cooking Club. Their unique collaboration and ideation resulted in the Song of Freedom series. Today they will share their books as a window into an exciting historical period that has shaped modern India. Welcome, Aditi and Lubaina. We look forward to a delightful morning. I'd like to now invite Nina to introduce our young and vibrant dot. Yeah, we leave it at that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, ladies, uh, just a quick few announcements before we go ahead. Just to say that we're going to meet you guys back only in June, right? Right? But we'll try to meet in the month of May. Uh, Radhika, your friendship basket, when they meet in May. Where's Radhi? Yeah. Yes, tell all of us. So maybe we could make that an event, yeah? Because two months seems too long, right? Okay, and uh, I would like to thank all the members who are getting in their buddies and, you know, increasing the membership of Duchess. So thank you very much, girls, yeah? Thank you for being a helping hand for the Duchess, yeah? And, um, okay, now... If everyone's wondering who Zara is, I'll tell you, yeah? Zara Amiruddin, can you stand up and be recognized? Zara is an independent writer, photographer, and educator based in Bombay, India. Apart from being published by diverse national and international magazines, her work, it has been published in all these magazines, such as the National Geographic Traveler, the Hindu Vogue L and the Condé Nast Traveler, 
uh, India, amongst others. Her main areas of interest include quite a few art, history, astronomy, personal narratives, and family histories. She has exhibited her work internationally in Paris. Is it Paros? Paros, Greece, and Seoul, South Korea, and is currently developing a collaborative project with 830, a women's photography collective in India. Okay. On a very personal note, she is none other than the dynamic daughter-in-law of the dynamic mother-in-law, Sujata Mundra. Welcome, Zara. And thanks for getting today's meeting going for us. Hi, everybody. It's so lovely to actually see people with bodies below the head. <laughs> So um, actually, today is a very exciting day uh, for many reasons. Number one, I think the fact that I can be a part of this whole experience uh, that I've heard so much about from my mother-in-law. And secondly, um, Lubaina Bandukala also happens to be my Masi and also someone who uh, she, I, I will proudly claim that she started storytelling with me. <laughs> So, um, yeah, just to give y'all a little bit about both Lubaina and Aditi. Lubaina Bandukwala has a master's degree in journalism, but has followed her heart into children's publishing as a writer, editor, and festival curator. Her flagship festival, Pika Book, is held at the Royal Opera House in December. As subject matter expert in contemporary children's literature, she has been invited as a speaker at TEDx and on several panels, including She the People Writers Festival, Avid Learning, and Kalagora Arts Festival. She has also published a total of eight books, and she proudly says that she does all of the above because she can read a lot of children's book, books and call it grown-up work. And now moving on to Aditi. Uh, Aditi's first book, A Whole Summer Long, was published in 2012. She was shortlisted for the Scholastic Asian Book Award in 2014 for her manuscript Ergo Sum, which was later rewritten as The Magicians of Mud. Aditi actually has a BSc in Math, Physics, and Computer Science, an MBA, and an MA in English and an LLB. She has worked in the finance industry in India and Singapore and currently works for a Singapore based hedge fund. She loves reading and is a fan of fantasy, mythology, and Star Wars. Woohoo, Star Wars. <laughs> Today, they're here to discuss their immersive stories, um, Lubaina Bandukala's book, The Chopati Cooking Club, and Aditi Krishna Kumar's book, That Year at Money Coil. It's part of the uh, Songs of Freedom series published by Doug Bill, and the books encapsulate the experience of children during the freedom struggle. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite Lubaina Bandukwala and Aditi Krishnakumar on stage. Thank you. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a little nervous. You're going to have to excuse me. Um, but it's lovely to be here. I um, I live in Singapore, actually, although I was born in Madras. And naturally, thanks to COVID, I have gone nowhere for the last two and a half years. And it is incredible to be back here in Madras to see everyone and um, to come back to Savera, where I used to come a lot as a child and to be part of something like this. I'm grateful to you all for having me, grateful to Levina for helping set this up and for like being great to work with. Uh, so thank you. And um, actually kind of uh, COVID is how the, for me, this whole thing started because I was in Singapore and I was like working on one of the edits of my previous book and then my hard drive crashed. 
And foolishly, I hadn't backed up for like three days. So I was really, really, really upset. And while it was at the uh, shop and they were trying to fix it, I texted Sayoni, who, um, who's my editor at Duckville. And I said, okay, now I don't know what to do. So I want to write historical fiction. And she said, okay, brilliant. I have an idea because Sayoni is wonderful. Like she never says no when I say these random things to her. And, um, and so she said that uh, she maybe wanted to do something about the independence movement, India's uh, 75th year of independence is now. And she, uh, she thought it would be nice to have some books about that and about what children experienced during the, the struggle for independence. And when she said that, the first thing I thought of was the story um, I used to hear when I was a child. I still hear it. Uh, my great grandmother, my grandmother's mother had 10 children which seems extraordinary now, but apparently it was quite normal for that time. And at one point she, um, she was either pregnant or she had a small child or quite possibly both. And she had to travel by train. And this being like the, the 40s, um, it wasn't done for a woman to travel by train alone. She had to have an escort. And she, uh, my, grand, my great grandfather couldn't go with her and he, um, he was acquainted with many people who were freedom fighters at that time. And one of them who has been variously reported to me as either Lal Bahadur Shastri or Bal Gangadhar Tilak went with her. And um, I always thought that must have been so incredible, you know, for my great grandmother and whichever of my great aunts or great uncles it was who accompanied her to get to see someone who was so involved in everything that was happening was right there at the forefront of the freedom movement and get to talk to them that must have been so much fun and and so that was what i wanted to start this book with which um <clears throat> which i kind of did and it all kind of hangs together because um the way i see historical fiction is that um kind of like science fiction it asks major philosophical questions, but it does so from the standpoint of the great movements of human history. You know, people have been doing this thing, this is where society takes us and what questions does it lead to, which in the 1940s at a time when colonialism and imperialism were beginning to end um, in Asia and Africa. And people, and not just because people were struggling for independence, but because, um, because philosophical thought and cultural thought around the world was veering towards this idea that everyone should have the right to self-determination, which for me led to the question of what independence really means, you know, aside from the fact that it's not King George anymore and it's not Churchill or whoever the British prime minister is, there's someone else who's making your laws and someone else whose face is on your currency. What does freedom mean when you're to you when you're living your everyday life because we don't like go and meet the prime minister every day. How does it matter to us? And we also don't, we don't even have currency notes anymore. Like you just pay by your card everywhere. So what does it matter? Why is freedom important? What does it mean? And these were questions that, um, that I felt it would be interesting to explore and that I think naturally arise from, uh, from writing about this period and especially from writing from the point of view of a child because children are always at that phase where they're trying to get more freedom and that they want to do things, they want to explore, they want to learn. And usually parents are telling them, be careful, don't go here, don't go there, don't do this, you'll hurt yourself, you'll fall down. So um, I think that's the point that freedom is not only the right to go there, but the knowledge that you may fall down. And if you fall down, you have to get up again and deal with it. So that, um, that was something that I'm, I'm very glad I, I got to explore uh, through this book. Um, the setting also kind of immediately made sense to me because I was very lucky as a child. I got to spend a lot of time with my grandparents. They used to tell me stories of when they were growing up. I think that's partly why the series makes so much sense now because many of us still have, you know, grandparents, great aunts, great uncles who experienced the freedom struggle as children or as young men and women. And although they may not all have directly participated, some of them probably did, some of them didn't, they may not have marched, they may not have you know, gone to jail, they may not have done these things, but they were still there and they still have more of a sense of what that was like than, 
than we could possibly understand now, I think. And so I wanted this to mirror as, um, as closely as possible the atmosphere in which my grandparents grew up. And I was lucky in, uh, enough to be able to visit um, the villages where they grew up very often as a child. And, and so that was, um, that was something I could write. And through, uh, through Raji, who is the, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I should tell you what the book is about. So uh, the book is about a young girl, Raji, who, whose brother has um, gone to fight in World War II, which was on at that time, and um, Indian soldiers were also going to fight in World War II. And due to the fear of, um, of an attack, on Madras, she was living in Madras with her parents, she was sent away to her grandparents' village, which I, I mean, after like many of my great aunts and uncles read this book, they called me and like, oh yeah, I remember this happened to me and we buried all our family silver in the garden and stuff. So yeah, yeah, one of my great aunts told me this, that they buried, I hope they did. <laughs> so, um, and this is basically about how she, um, how she gets used to being in Manikoil, the village. I mean, not gets used to it because she knows it, but how her experiences, not just in the village, but um, with the influx of refugees, which is also a thing that happened at the time from countries across Southeast Asia as World War II, as the fighting progressed along the Southeast Asian coast, people were fleeing into India. And that, um, although I don't think I... I could have foreseen at the time what would be happening now. I think it's, that's always something that's very relevant, how we treat strangers and refugees and people who are different from us. It was relevant in the 1940s. It's relevant now. It will probably be relevant in 100 years. And so uh, this book is about Raji, her sisters, the friends she makes, and how she comes to an understanding of what, um, what freedom is and what it means and why it matters so much to all the people who are fighting for it and also to her. And the other thing I got to explore with this book is that um, I think it's natural when there is any system that is, um, that is going away to make way for a new system. And in India at that time, this was not just the British who were going away, but the old... Um, the old system of monarchies, which had existed before the British, was also going to go away and there was going to be democracy, which was new in India. And this was probably very scary for a lot of people. And this is something you can understand because what is, even if what exists is not perfect and if it's exploitative and even if it has a lot of problems and you know it, there's still a sort of visceral fear that you feel when you're beginning something entirely new. And this is something that I got to explore um, through, through the eyes of a child, because that again is sort of what childhood is also. There are new things that are happening and they're scary, but they're wonderful and you have to get ready for them and face them. And I feel like that, um, that just sort of worked well together. And so that, um, that's the reason I'm like really glad. i grateful to um, Duckville. I'm glad I got the chance to write this book because it let me, um, you know, I'd heard my grandparents' stories all my life, but I'd never sat down and thought about it and said, what does this mean? And it let me realize that freedom is something that people fought for, that real people fought for and suffered for, and bad things happened to them, but they still fought on because it matters. And I think I might never have come to that realization if I hadn't written this book, so I'm very grateful I got the chance. And yeah, okay, that's it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Could you not say more things so then I don't have to speak? <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm also like, uh, you know, uh, very, very happy to be here for one very important reason is that Indian children's books have really come into their own in the past decade. Yet we don't really get a platform to show off our books. So to be here amongst you incredible people and say that there are some lovely Indian children's authors, well, me, of course, 
and Aditi and, you know, and here I want a tip of the hat to Shobha and uh, Anushka, pioneers, I would say, uh, in Indian children's books, because really all of it happened in your city in Chennai. We probably have the three most biggest independent earliest Indian children book publishers here. So I'm grateful to be here. Also grateful to be here because I think this series that I've had the fortune, you know, good fortune to be part of, Songs of Freedom is an incredibly relevant and important series as we go into our 75th year of Indian independence. For children to actually understand, like if I talk to any of my nieces and nephews and my, my girls, you know, what is freedom? They'll say, ah, so there was non-cooperative movement. There was, you know, Rolat Act. There was Jallianwala Bagh. But what does freedom mean? You know, what does it mean to you? Oh, freedom, yeah, it happens in textbook. That is long answer, short answers. Like, hello, you know, there's a lot more to that. So to, as Aditi says, the opportunity to ourselves explore and understand what is freedom and to bring it alive for children was a marvelous opportunity. Although for me, <clears throat> it was more personal. And uh, like all stories that happened in this time, it began during the pandemic. Uh, Bombay was under a complete lockdown. Okay, it was seriously depressing. I would look out of my balcony and I swear I never thought I would miss traffic, but I really did. <laughs> it's like, where are the fumes? Where are the horns? I mean, somebody bring them back. But that was also a time when my dad was really ill. And uh, it was a task for me to get from my house to his house. Uh, you know, fight all the Naka Bandis and beg the policemen and say, listen, I need to go take my dad to dialysis and do all of that. So I used to go spend two nights uh, there, you know, give my mom a bit of relief. And in the night, you know, my dad used to not sleep at all. And I used to say, dad, I mean, why, why are you not sleeping? I mean, you know, uh, and he would say, I don't know. I just, I don't, don't feel like I want to sleep. And I used to say, you know, like all new age people think happy thoughts, you know? So he's like, okay, well, whatever. I'm 90 years old, so you don't give me that advice. But he said, so I said, okay, tell me your most happy memory. And he said, uh, he thought, and he said, uh, you know, it was, uh, my happiest memory was when I went on my honeymoon. And I was like, oh, that's a nice story. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, this was in the 1960s, and he said, we took a plane for the first time, your mom and me, and we went to Sri Lanka, which was unusual because you didn't really, even Sri Lanka was like going, uh, you know, abroad somewhere, basically, Ceylon, they used to call it. Uh, he still called it Ceylon, basically. And, you know, he told me that story, and, and I remember when I was a kid, and when we were sleeping at night, the last thing would be, dad would come and snuggle up, and he would say, he would tell us stories about his house in Surat, he would tell us about, you know, going off on a steamer to England for the first time as a young person, you know. Uh, and I just thought all of those stories that I heard, you know, somebody needs to write them down and that somebody is me, um, you know. And I, I sat and wrote them down every time I, you know, went there and he would tell me his stories and I would write it. And, and one part of me had this sadness that, you know, he used to tell me stories to put me to sleep. Now he's telling his story so I can put him to sleep, you know. So it was kind of poignant, but I thought, you know, so I wrote it all down. And even as I was writing them, then I talked to my mom and my mother-in-law. And I thought, actually, all of us, me, you, her, we're all pieces of history, you know, in what we do, in how we react to the world around us, in the choices we make. We are products of our environment, you know. None of this comes up in history books. No wonder the kids go to sleep when I'm saying, you know, you have to study this, you know. There's nothing personal about history. The personal stuff comes from our personal stories. And I thought I should apply this to something. Now, my mom lived in Gamdevi, and her house was a source of constant inspiration to me. All our summer holidays were spent there. I think, I think children's books authors take summer in their heart to every book that they write, you know. Uh, and I thought, and everywhere around Gamdevi, you know, something important in the freedom struggle happened. 
there was the quit india movement announcement happened there right there at august Kranti maidan aruna asif ali raised the flag over there uh, down the road you know uh, they used the whole underground movement happened over there and yeah i was just so excited by the idea of an underground movement i was like wow what is this mysterious thing <laughs> And then there was this amazing thing I stumbled upon, a secret radio. And I was like, what? Somebody ran a secret radio? So I was enthralled. So then I just you know, said, OK, I have the stories of my mom and my dad. And I have the stories of history. And I would like to put it all together. And then there was this recurring thought that we are also, again, at a crucial point in our nation where we make choices about you know, what is freedom? What does it mean to us? What does it mean for me to be a citizen of a democratic nation? The roots of those questions lie in what I think was the most important era in modern India, which defined modern India, which is like the freedom struggle. And I think for children to understand what is freedom, they need to understand what is it not to have freedom. None of us, I mean, we don't know, at least I don't know a world in which I didn't have freedom. Uh, but that generation, which is, was part or at least had witnessed the freedom struggle, they were all going away now. There was hardly any of them going to be left. So therefore, it was important to take those firsthand stories. And I met some amazing people and incorporate them into this book, The Topati Cooking Club. Uh, you know, I still get a kick seeing my name on the cover, sorry. <laughs> so uh, it's about three young uh, children who are living in, well, Chopati, and uh, they sort of stumble upon, I mean, at the time, they are just young kids, uh, a huge movement happens in the neighborhood where Gandhiji declares, you know, uh, the quit India movement, he says, quit India, or we will do whatever it takes, do or die, you know, and these children are so energized, they're like, wow, do or die, but what do children do? I mean, you know, they said, we go out on the streets and do like morchas and stuff. And their grandparents are like, on grandfather says, you quietly sit at home because there might be riots outside and children can't do anything. So children tend to feel very helpless, but my little three protagonists end up being involved in the freedom struggle. Um, they sort of, uh, their lives get intertwined with a whole lot of people who are very active in the freedom struggle and they don't realize that they are being part of this. And of course, I'm not gonna tell you more because that would give away my book. But these three kids not only just be part of the freedom struggle, they also begin to understand what it means, the sacrifices that it took to make a free uh, sort of country. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of food in there. So yeah, it was fun to write the book. <laughs> uh, it's set in 1942 Mumbai. Um, and I, I had so much fun trying to, you know, get into the city. So much so that I used to walk around Bombay and I'm not seeing Kali Pili taxis and red buses. I'm seeing it all in black and white, you know. Oh, there's a tram, there's a, you know, Tonga, there's a, you know, all of those things. So uh, I really enjoyed getting into uh, the whole uh, thing. And I just wanted to quickly share with you one of the reasons that I it was so easy to get into it was um, I had an uncle who, before he passed, he told his grandson, uh, this box, give it to Lubaina, she'll take care of it. So everybody's like, wow, like treasure in it and stuff like that. And the box came to me and it was a box full of newspaper clippings from the 1920s to the 1960s. It was incredible, it was a bonanza. It was as if I was reading the newspapers through all the times. And so I could sort of immerse myself in that time, you know. So the 1940s really came alive to me. And, and one of the things that I read in the newspaper as, as you know, Aditi uh, in a far more erudite manner, because she has a degree in math, wow. You know, so <laughs> explained, was that it was a very nuanced era. There's no black and white. There was such a huge change from a shift of a colonial mindset to a possibility of a democratic nation in which every person could be a partic participant. Everybody thought different about it. It's not like everybody wanted freedom. Some people didn't, they were scared of it because they had a vested interest in being government servants. So if the British went away, they would lose their jobs. Some of them were industrialists, they didn't like that. 
Some of them were freedom fighters, some of them just didn't care, you know. So those newspapers gave me a really good view of, you know, different people and how they reacted to the freedom movement. Uh, may I uh, show some of the clippings if, uh, can you? And I have these many characters who I thought I sorted them out as newspaper clippings. Uh, they made scrapbooks basically. So this is a newspaper clipping of what I thought the kids would enjoy. Uh, I found this really cool stuff. There were these two Parsi girls who actually went to Buckingham Palace to be presented to the king. At the same time, Sarojini Naidu was giving fiery speeches all over the country that throw the British out, you know. So it was quite fascinating. And uh, this was a picture of, and there was, you know, the kids were very fascinated by the actresses who would have this red colored lipstick. So they would sort of crush strawberries and put them on their lips, basically. So this is one of them. Can we have the next one, please? These were all actually, there were some Gujarati papers, there were Times of India, there were, you know, it was all kinds of uh, people. And this was the entertainment scene in Mumbai in the 1940s. <laughs> so there was this cool traveling, uh, you know, uh, troupe that came from Australia later I found. And in fact, when the Royal Opera House saw this on our Instagram, they said, please, can you give us the clipping? I said, no chance. You know, you can post it on your Instagram, but I'm keeping this. And then there was Shanta Apte and, you know, uh, Bollywood was uh, quiet because there was a lot of, you know, freedom movement things happening, but it was Bollywood. So uh, the big studios came into, you know, play at this point. The next one, if you don't mind. Which one is this? Yeah. So then I had one uncle who was an Anglophile. Uh, I don't know if any of you had those, but we had one uncle who was such an Anglophile. He would come to your house for tea and he would try and look under the, you know, cup to see if it was made in England. You know, even if it meant spilling the tea, it's like everything was like, oh, it's made in England. That means it's really nice, you know. <laughs> so I, I had a character like that. And so I assumed these were the kind of paper clippings he would put in his scrapbook, basically very sycophantic basically. The next one, if you don't mind. Yeah, so this was this was such an amazing picture. This was a group of ladies probably like you who would do lots of social work. And they had, you know, um, it, it, World War II had just started. So the Red Cross and all of that would uh, sort of rope in ladies and they would do sales. This was in a convent garden in England where there were saris and they were selling flowers to raise funds for the war. And then they would have sewing clubs where they would sort of sew bandages and stuff like that for, uh, you know, uh, people. Uh, yeah, that's it, I think, right? Or is there another one? No, that's it. So these were the kind of pictures that gave me an insight into the life of what happened uh, in uh, the 1940s Bombay. And uh, yeah, that's about it from me as well. So uh, I'm going to ask Aditi a few questions, if you don't mind. <laughs> So Aditi, my book has a lot of food in it because as you can see, I'm quite, I mean, I enjoy my food, <laughs> but it was also a device to bring three communities together. You know, uh, they, in the Gamdevi area in Mumbai, three Gujarati communities usually used to live, Gujaratis, Parsis, Moras, and uh, they were sort of linked by language and uh, occasionally by certain kinds of food as well. So these ladies had a cooking club and uh, well, there's a thing about the cooking club. So, but food plays an important role in my book and food plays an important part in your book as well. In, was it a literary device or do you just like food? No, of course I like food, I mean, clearly, but uh, yeah. Well, I then some of the fun things, I've never heard of those snacks. I mean, I'm sure they're all familiar with you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so the, I think what really happens is, and this is something kids always enjoy. You go to your grandmother's house and there's murka and jangris and, you know, omopuri and all these delicious things that are always coming out of the kitchen. And for me, that was, um, that was just a way of, of making it feel like, like a summer at your grandmother's house, because yeah, for me, that's definitely, that's part of it, like with my grandmothers, that's what they do, that's how they 
express themselves that's how yeah exactly that's how they show their love they make you things that you like you know if you have a cough they'll make you lemon ginger rasam and if you're not feeling well they'll make you something else and they will i think um what i was trying to do with that was um sort of show the the comforts of of a home life that um raji has that sort of contrasts with um what one of her friends i i don't think that's a spoiler one of her friends in the book is a malay refugee uh ilavalji and she um so they have brought a couple of things with them a couple of spices but i think just um just for her to see the cultural difference between herself and ilavalji and that her friend although she's brought some things with her is still so removed from her home and from what she's used to i think i did um i did kind of use food that way food is comfort right yeah yeah it gives you a sense of sort of belonging it does it's like who you are yeah. so also another thing in uh, in her book that i really loved and i i want to share is the picture you drew of a village life in the 1940s you know and what i loved is i i didn't i hadn't met aditi before and i was so happy that both of our books were you know uh the first in the series because it's so different and yet in some ways so same right i mean mine is an urban setting mumbai hers is a rural setting and yet i, I hadn't met her i didn't know what she was writing but we had the same sense of the you know how the freedom movement was being played out across the country and how children were perceiving it basically so i i just wanted to ask you you know completely off topic because i struggle with this you're a full time working person you're a full time mom how do you write <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> okay honestly i think it just comes down to figuring out what it is that you want to do because i've got friends singapore is the kind of place where you go there and you're like you visit thailand and you know vietnam you're traveling all around southeast asia australia and stuff which i don't do i do like you know i've got friends who are off every weekend and i don't get to do that so i i feel like you just have to make compromises like you figure out what it is that you want to do and then you make sure you have time for that wow <laughs> do i get to ask you questions now you feel free please ask me easy one <laughs> oh okay okay well um one of the things i thought was really cool about um lubaina's book is that it's a fictionalization of something that um really happened although perhaps the details are a bit different so one of the things i wanted to know is how easy is that to take not just um setting but an actual incident or or thing that really happened and turn that into a fictional story yeah that's one of the challenges of writing historical fiction yeah um this particular uh episode i would say in history and you always want to be careful because you don't want anybody to come and say okay this is historically inaccurate and also you want to represent it correctly basically so i just take the spirit of the thing you know and change all the names first of all it's like no i was not talking about that person so don't you know say anything and uh, yeah in this particular case when you're talking about uh, i assume you mean the freedom uh, radio perhaps the secret radio so there was a secret radio there was a person there was you know a, a whole incredible story that is even more exciting than my book actually the you know but i could not i did not want to make it accurate because what's the fun i didn't want to rewrite history i wanted to make my own story around history so i just took the idea and the idea of you know the underground movement was an amazing thing it was just after the quit india announcement was made all of the leaders were just taken away to jail so all of india was in chaos you know but it was not because gandhi ji had said that there may come a time when there's no leadership everybody do something to resist the british government so all over the country there were all kinds of little little movements and the secret radio was one of these resistance movements basically and i thought it was so ahead of its times you know So yeah I just took the idea and then made up my own thing about it basically. Wait I got one more question. Okay. This is I think more a question about your craft but another of the things I really love about the book is um 
Sakina sort of internal monologue and how much like um, I, I think I've asked you this before at some point, but I absolutely love how much her teachers influencing yeah. what she does. So how was that easy sort of balancing her internal monologue with the with the real events that were happening? Uh, so Sakina is my main protagonist. She's a little girl. Uh, she's in fifth standard. I don't know how old that makes her basically. And she's a highly imaginative child. So she's in her mind larger than life. She thinks like she's some great heroine. I mean, she's walking around in her head only. She's thinking I'm like, you know, the king of the world and I'm solving the world's problems. But uh, actually, I, I, I didn't really plan that much. But Sakina was very clear in my mind. I just knew who she was basically. And then I found that, you know, to contrast her with the world around her, uh, us was a good device in her coming of age. You know, what she imagined and what was reality came to a nice circle at the end, basically. I don't think that means anything, but maybe if you read the book, you might. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to see if how well versed you are in the freedom struggle. Okay, so I'm going to do a little quiz here. Is that okay? Anushka, I'm watching you. <laughs> so, um, all right. Does anybody know who coined the term quit India? I know, I know Google allowed. <laughs> Do you know? Yeah, well, you read the book. Yeah, so. <laughs> no, uh, he's he's a very he's not very well known. He's well known in Mumbai, basically. He's a gentleman called Yusuf Meher Ali. He was a a socialist. Yeah, and he's coined like a lot of. Things that, you know, uh, the quit India, do or die, all of those were his, he, I guess he would have got a job in advertising now, basically. So <laughs> uh, that's one. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, so one of the things that happens in my book is during World War II, there was um, a Southeast Asia Radio Command. I think it was called like Radio Southeast Asia Command, which was used by the Allied powers to broadcast um, news about uh, how much news, how much propaganda, I don't know, but to broadcast information about the war. And after World War II, that then became civilian and became much more popular under another name. Oh, radio. Oh. No, no, it wasn't the BBC. Yes, that's right. Oh Yay. <laughs> yes. Radio Salon, I mean, we used to listen to it all the time. Binaka, Geet Mala and all that. <laughs> yeah. I'm really dated. Sorry. <laughs> Do you have another question? Oh. Okay. Um, so the other question is um, one of the, the major engagements of World War II, one of one that is considered a turning point of the war in Asia was fought on what is currently Indian soil. So anyone Ooh. know which one that was? No, no, not in Madras. Yes. Kohima. Kohima. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> I have one. Um, after the announcement of the Quit India movement, uh, all of the leaders got arrested and they were taken to different jails all over the country. So they couldn't sort of communicate and, you know, conspire as they called it. Uh, Gandhiji was taken to a jail that is very famous now. Which city? Very simple. I should have asked something harder. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. <laughs> Do you have any others? Well, we're open to interrogation if you like. Yeah. <laughs> you go first. Yeah. Okay. 
I wasn't because I thought my hand will shake. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to read the beginning. Uh, basically, this is, uh, you know, well, it's the prologue before the thing. It's called Royal Letters. 12th October 1942, 2.30pm. Hoity-toity Mina Miss dropped each perfectly formed word from her lips over the heads of class 5B. The eyes are the window to your soul. And then I tried to peer into her soul via her eyes and got three raps on the knuckle with a ruler for my pains. Black. I'm sure her soul is black as a lump of coal. That evening, Bela auntie got arrested. The police came to get her at 5 p.m. complete with a British officer. Within minutes, all the neighbors had gathered around. More people came and started chanting, Vande Matram, Karenge ya Marenge, as she climbed into the jeep, calm and dignified. And as sped away, she turned and looked back at us, Zenobia, Mehul and me. And in that second, I understood what Miss Hoity Toity had been saying. If Bela Auntie's eyes were a window, her soul was a blazing with fire, leaping brilliant flames of fire. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to do the same and read from the beginning of the book. And this is when uh, Raji and her sisters are still in Madras. They don't yet know that there's um, danger of being bombed and they're going to be sent away. So April 1944. On an April day when I was nine years old, I had my first inkling that my world was going to change. I woke at dawn, as I did on most days, to the sound of my mother singing the Supratham. She had excellent lungs. Her voice carried to every room of the house and edified passing traffic on the road outside. I sat up in bed, folded my hands and sang along. This show of piety had an ulterior motive. I had my maths exam that day. With no illusions about my abilities in that direction, I was willing to take any help going, including Venkata Chalapati's. My older sisters, Vasanta and Valli, whose mattresses were already rolled up in the corner, laughed unkindly. In maths, as in most other subjects, I was the exception in my brilliant family. In class after class, I had failed to live up to the shining examples set by my sisters. The expectation held by my parents, siblings, and teachers was that I would continue to do so. Check, check. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sharda, and uh, I've just come back after a, a little trip to Amritsar. Okay. So, talking about freedom, uh, of course, we went to the museum there, the Partition Museum, the Jalan Malabar, etc. Of course, when you read off all those, like you said, we in Chennai, uh, I mean, as we grow up, it's not been very much affected. So, the freedom fighters and the other things, maybe the North had uh, more exposure to it. Um, second point, uh, of course, there was a lot of freedom thing. The second point which I want to ask is, all these, when you see the sound and light show in Jalan Bagh, etc., it really tears your heart, okay? Now, how do you think, uh, when you, as you all are writing children's books, and we, when we grew up, we studied in a convent, so we have seen the, from the British side of it, okay? From the British side, we've read the history. How do you think you're going to put it across to this generation? How do you feel that, you know, uh, cutting down on all that too much of a oppressive type? So you think uh, it will have an impact, the children's books in today's times? And uh, how do you think uh, the authors can put it across to the children? Um, okay, so I think it is true that children today, especially uh, maybe growing up in Madras, you may have fewer physical reminders around you of the freedom movement and of the things that happened. 
But I think although that actual incident they may not remember, the people everywhere still, it's a, it's a human instinct, I think, to fight against oppression. And people will always be able to recognize it when, well, maybe not always, but in most times when it happens, they'll know it. And if it's not happening in exactly the same way, it is still happening and it is still relevant because every society, every culture, there are always people who have power. And after a certain point, the instinct of the people in power is to hold on to their power, which is perhaps natural, but it leads to the oppression of the people who don't have the power. And I think that's something children will recognize, even if it's in a different form, and they will be able to relate to it. Lubaina? I just want to add that what we do in children's books, really, is uh, the stories are about children. Uh, and therefore, we look at the world through the eyes of children. Uh, we look at freedom. We look at oppression. Uh, everything through the eyes of children. They may not be... Uh, what somebody went through at Jalianwala Bagh or through the partition, but it's more fundamental. It's about questioning how you might feel if somebody bullies you in school, for example. You know, you take it to a broader level. What does it mean when you were forced, compelled to be, you know, your life was determined by an external power? That's the same as being bullied in school, right? Uh, so all of those things, all of those uh, ways we break it down and bring it to how a child would feel in a certain situation uh, and then put it in a context. And somewhere deep inside, you know, they, they'll read it as a story right now. But when they encounter it in the real world, we hope it will sort of ring a bell, you know, and say, oh, right, that was, you know, what happened, basically. That's how we connect it, basically. And the, the funny thing about this book is, of course, I hope kids like it, but there's enormous amounts of people of all ages who seem to like it. You know, they're all like, you know, oh, I remember my grandfather did, said this, my grandmother said this, I was part of it. So I think these questions, which, you know, you, you may have studied the history differently, but it's time for self-examination right now. Maybe this rings a bell. So, yeah, I hope. Everybody reads this book, basically. Hey, good morning. Thanks for that lovely conversation. But in connection with this whole question about, um, um, about children's books and stuff, I'm also reminded of this film, Jojo Rabbit. Yeah. Which, uh, and so I think saying a story... And I think in a society, having different perspectives is very important, which is, which is why I subscribe to this whole idea, not just the government approved history books, but to have various viewpoints, I think is very important in any society. And so it's interesting. And I think with children, we are able to address um, the deeper political points and the social implications in a very, like Jojo Rabbit, I think made very strong statements. But uh, I think with art, we are able to camouflage things, but push thoughts so that people think about it. And um, I think uh, when we process things like this, we also understand how art can be used to manipulate. Whether it was the way Hitler uh, manipulated uh, Europe then with radio, using radio as a thing. So I think you're opening up a lot of possibilities, especially when you write for children. Adults, of course, read it, the child within. Thank you so much. Yeah. As really well said. I mean, I sort of went at the heart of what, you know, I think both Aditi and I really uh, examine the plurality of viewpoints. And I think that can only happen if you are documenting personal histories. Uh, that never appears in textbooks, basically. You know, when you do oral history, you talk to people, then you realize that they're all different viewpoints, basically. Um, hi, thank you so much. Uh, this is my first meeting actually here, and I'm so glad that it started off with the book uh, event. Uh, so my question for you both is that, uh, so I, re I read out books, even yesterday I was reading Shobha's book for my daughter. So, uh, Yay, <laughs> and um, my question is, where, how do you filter and make it, uh, like what's the thought process that goes into you when you uh, make it more simplified for the children to understand? Because I struggle for a lot of complicated things that they ask questions for. Most of the time, I know the answer, but I don't know how to put it 
it's a simple way or very you know as a plain simple way so when you write you, you would have that a lot uh, make it more less complex and yeah. you know well it definitely is uh, requires thought you know uh, for me actually it is it's just getting to the heart of the issue and then articulating it in my own way uh, in a sense okay about kids basically you really have to relate it to them basically like i said about this bullying thing uh, if you take broader concepts and relate it to something that children can relate to and if you're a mom you'll see this happening every day something or the other that you can relate to basically you know if they don't like certain kinds of foods you know you can say up talk about you know how hard it was to get food at a certain point in time it it's just relating it to the child's experiences you will find yourself explaining it much easier um and there's a time for everything maybe they didn't don't need to know marks at like four or five you know so don't try explaining that to them uh yeah i think um honestly my personal view on this is that details are fine i mean you don't want to traumatize kids with unpleasant things but children are capable of understanding and accepting and working through very complex ideas as long as you're not putting it to them in a way that puts them off i am putting your own sort of perspective to I'm it and putting your own perspective to it so i think what's important is just to be kind of open and free yeah i have a question uh, uh, for lubaina um i like the point i mean you brought made a st uh, statement that uh, freedom is again very relevant in today's times and uh, yes i i do think that it's become very relevant in uh, today not just uh, in india but other parts of the world also but it's uh, very subtle i mean uh, in a child children's book i guess it must have been de dealt in a very subtle way i would like to see i probably be reading the book just to see how you've dealt with it and uh, as it's been uh, you know uh, brought out in any way in the book i think that uh, in my book uh, like you know um, basically any any book at the heart of it is a journey for your main character they get from point a to point b point a being the start of the book and point b at the end of the book and in the middle they go through transformations and they become in some way richer or different at the end of the book that's the heart of pretty much any story as anushka told me in a workshop so <laughs> uh when you develop your character and they go through a set of circumstances in this case the environment and the freedom struggle around them and the coming of age of the child of beginning to understand how what freedom means i mean that is so trite i don't want to keep repeating it but it wasn't just freedom what it means to have a voice what it means to oppose a power what it means to actually be participant in what will be your own nation and there is a lovely line in her book which i keep repeating when you know the raji asks the mom what is freedom and the mom says which means the country will belong to every single one of us you know uh, older people and children so at the end of it sakina realizes it what it means to be in a country that is not ruled by a foreign power because a set of circumstances uh, sort of she interacts with and realizes that thing so it's a natural progression uh, that coming of age of your character which i think children will understand what it means uh, to be part of a free country basically so that's what i have um hi i'm hina i'm halfway through reading your book and i absolutely love it so thanks for writing it first of all wow well, yeah. and uh, I've been a history teacher for a while for middle school and high school. But well, would you like to recommend the schools? <laughs> I will. I will definitely. And I've always struggled uh, to have children get interested in the freedom struggle because they don't connect to it. Yeah. So this is going to be an absolute boon and I'm really going to ask all at least the primary and middle school to read the, this book, both the books 
so that they can one be a part of that uh, movement and uh, i would request both of you to maybe take in take up more uh, other than quit india maybe other movements that happen and uh, write more from the children's perspective this is going to really help them well um, you know dug bill uh, the publisher has uh, started this series called songs of freedom and our two books are the first there are two more coming out now by two incredible authors and the whole idea was to understand um, uh, through the eyes of children from across the country so it's not only you know i mean bombay has had a lot of uh, freedom movement and uh, i think uh, i'm assuming uh, you know leslie will do west bengal and so uh, because she writes a lot of you know so i think you're going to have a series that's going to pretty much cover different movements different eras of the freedom struggle and different parts of the country so um keep track of the frogs of freedom yeah i think additional reading will be put things in context you know i, I really would love for children to read this series uh, but thank you for half way reading the book how exciting <laughs> it was really enchanting to listen to both of y'all and it was a different point of view from two generations i wanted to ask you like i don't like reading okay uh, being very open but i love listening to so is this on audio by any chance because you know the way you express i would love to go to that story you know other than me reading and imagining because i have always like listening so are you all going on audio Uh, with you being the the actor in it and reading it from your way <laughs> let me talk to my editor <laughs> i hope so. yeah i hope it becomes hello. an audio book it'll be fun so uh, a lot hello. of lot of children like audio books so yes. i think that's lovely um one suggestion from me also for your further books um i think when we were kids in school and when we were doing history we learned more about the foreign invasions and um, about aurangzeb and babur and alexander and uh, there was not much about our our indian heroes like i've been reading about alia bai holkar rani of jhansi and all i think uh, we don't know so much more about them as we know about babur and humayun so your books should have you know feature those things also i feel if we have to because being a grandmother i've got a 7 year old uh, uh, a, a grand um, a boy two boys and uh, i read out a lot of stories to them and of course uh, whatever i read i relate to the instances now right. so uh, um, so there will be a time when i'll be giving these stories reading out these stories so books should feature those things also i feel there's like a plethora of indian children's books you can choose from you know i don't know if chennai has bookstores that you know have stock these books the, these two are goddesses of indian children's books <laughs> well i mean you guys have been pioneers so if you can point them in the right direction that would be great uh, but uh, there are you know uh, well of course i grew up with amar kritya katha so they had a lot of those but there are a lot more nuanced stories uh done by uh you know i think penguin has a series of um by a uh, uh, a historian writer devika rangachari. devika rangachari she she does no and even uh, uh, um the one who passed um uh, subhadra subhadra sen gupta look for subhadra's books she's written a lot of lovely indian history books uh and she has a series uh, one is set in hampi one is set in the chola uh, you know uh, this that it, those are really uh, lovely series of books uh, so yeah just you know if you get any of these bookstores independent bookstores uh, i know in in bangalore has bombay has i don't know if uh, chennai has you know like all of these you'll find a lot of stories basically so maybe i'll send you a reading list you can pass it on to your members <laughs> thank you um my mother has been my storyteller you know during my growing days and she grew up in kerala so i remember her telling me stories of the freedom struggle where she was stuck in a village in k 
Kerala. I mean, there's not much happening there, but still, you know, how things were so difficult, you know, during those days, those times. And of course, I grew up in Malaysia. So she, when she got married in the, you know, much later, she was in, in, in Malaysia. So at that time, it was World War II and how the Japanese occupation in Malaysia and life was so difficult then. And uh, so I heard those stories in my growing days. So, you know, it's a different world, but I guess it's all connected somewhere. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to reading both your books. Thank you. And actually my book may ring a bell. Yeah, ring a bell for you a little yeah. bit because I think I've forgotten the 50 years in between, you know, when I'm listening to all of you talk, I think I, it's just taking me back to my own childhood also. And uh, whatever store, hmm? what to say? Um, whatever stories I tell my grandchildren today is about what I experienced during my uh, childhood, right? And I think you guys are going to have competition from me. <laughs> because I think it's about uh, all of us penning down our thoughts. And um, I love the way you said about your teacher, uh, you know, hitting on the knuckles because teachers always did that, right? And no parents went to them and bombarded them. But we do it today, right? You know, so uh, thanks for that. And, and Aditi, you're inspiring me to uh, cook for my grandchildren. I don't do that. I would like to do that because when you said about the jangri and other things, I think I'm going to start cooking for them. Thank you so much. Happy grandchildren. I know. You should get us as invited. You can be an honorary grandchildren. Lubaina, why do you call your book the Chopati Cooking Club? I did read a parts of it where they are exchanging recipes from one household to the other. Yes. Well, the heart of the book, uh, the three children's three mums uh, form a cooking club where they are exchanging recipes, basically. And that sort of forms the sort of backbone of, uh, you know, the three children are messengers between these three households. They keep passing around recipes. And uh, I loved using the recipes in my own way. Like there's a chapter on which when, you know, uh, Sakina tells her this aunt, uh, uh, Mehul's mom, that what is freedom, you know? I mean, uh, why, why does it matter basically? And uh, Mehul's mom is making doklas at that time. So while she's making the dhokla, she's explaining how, you know, what if a guest came to your house and how would you treat them? So Sakina said, we'll take out our Royal Dalton set and we'll, you know, serve them tea. And so she says, okay, when the guest uh, uh, decides to stay for dinner, then she'll say, well, my uh, nani would get a little pissed, but she'd say, okay, fine, you stayed for dinner. We'd still be hospitable. Then the guest would decide to stay and they're going to stay the night. So then you'd say, okay, we'll make a room for them. Soon enough, uh, the guests are, you know, uh, staying in the house. They've moved to the main house and sent us off to the guest room. <laughs> so he says, that's what the British did. They came as our guests and, uh, you know, they sort of moved us like that. And <laughs> all of that is happening while auntie's making dough class because I like food. What can I say? You know, <laughs> so that's the Chopati cooking club. The ladies, you know, do these things basically. So. Uh, I can certainly re 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 uh, resonate with the, how a child feels when you're at war or when your freedom is at stake because I don't know which year it was. We were very much in Chennai and uh, it was, I think, the year 71 or something. Uh, a siren would go off and we would all quickly switch off the lights and, and yes, and we took it so seriously. And uh, once when this happened, uh, we kind of left one room light on. And I still re remember, you know, crawling to go and switch off that light. And we really felt that enemy was right there and he's able to spot us. You know, at that moment, you really were, felt that your life is at stake. So you did in your own small way understand 
what war is and what it is to lose one's freedom. So this is imprinted on my mind as a child. Whereas I'm, because we were safely away from uh, the real battle places or where the real action took place, but each one of our lives have been affected by this. And I belong to a um, state called Kerala. I mean, I belong to Kerala and a place called Waikam. There was a moment in Waikam where Gandhiji had come and very sadly, my grandfather took a part, which was, you know, I'm not very uh, uh, proud about it. He actually was holding the black flag to Gandhiji. So this is something is once again, our parents tell us these things and it's imprinted on our mind. Now only I realize that maybe our uh, elders, our grandparents were, you know, uh, a storehouse of uh, information. And it's such a pity that we didn't uh, take down notes from them and they are all gone now. But I'll be very thrilled to read your books, uh, ladies. Thank you so much. So I want to tell you, don't hold that against your grandfather, the black flag. <laughs> Everybody came from different perspectives. In fact, this book seems to have triggered a whole lot of memories. There was a lady who called me, a friend of mine from Tamil Nadu, and, and she was telling me that uh, when Gandhiji came through their towns, uh, three of her uncles were barristers who came from England, and they were very annoyed that Gandhiji came because... You see, it was, they were feeling threatened because it was a whole way of life that was going to disappear. Which is the thing about history? There's really no black and white. You come from a place where your life is going to be affected by the broader canvas. Now, who are we to judge, you know, whether what happened to you is right or wrong, you know? You're just lucky that if you did welcome Gandhiji, then, well, you're lucky because, you know, you were on the right side so to speak, you know, so yeah, that's what I have to say. I think the only thing I would add to that is we maybe have a bit of a tendency to blame the people of the past for not being moral philosophers. Yeah. And that's maybe not entirely fair because at this stage, we don't know, you know, like in a hundred years when people are looking back at the things we do, they'll probably say we did a lot of things that were horrible and how could people live with that? But people just do their best with the time they're in. Um, yeah, I, uh, Aditi and uh, Lubaina, we've got a few people on Zoom too. And uh, we just go to, yeah, so these are the comments. There's one gentleman by the name Abizar Tebji. <laughs> and he writes, super forum, authors were super relevant and riveting, as well as charming and funny. The quiz was a nice segue. The questions show the passion and the depth of the Duchess Club members. Uh, clap for the <laughs> well done. Signing off from Houston. 2 a.m. he says. Okay. Keep it up, Duchess Club. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abiza. Thank you. <laughs> any more questions? Are we having any more questions? I know, really, I tell you. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Thank you so much for. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aditi and Lubaina. You really took us back to our childhood memories. I still remember when the lights used to get switched off. I would peer, you know, and uh, look out the window and I would see these kind of aeroplanes, you know, I think it was during the 1970s or, yeah, you know, and the lights would be, you know, there's such frightening memories too, wondering what it's all about. We were just little kids then. So, yeah, a lot of unlearning for us to do to explain things to our little children now, you know. So, yeah, thank you so much. Good luck to you and uh, wish you all the very best. I would like to invite uh, Sarva Mangala. And uh, Hamsa, kindly come forward, please. Come, come, Hamsa, please come. Give the hand. Can give the hand for also, and then give the vote. Just give the hand. Come, Hamsa, yeah, give the yeah. Yeah, the other one, Sarvar Mangla. Come, Sarvar Mangla. Sarvar Mangla, I'll put it on. It's a little... 
Hindi. <laughs> no, I sure it's okay. No problem. Okay, okay. Yeah. This, <laughs> I'd like to invite Hamza to give the, yeah. Um, yeah, before Hamsa gives the formal thank you note, I would just, yeah, just uh, recognize our three new members who've come in today. Uh, one is Manju Hinduja, then um, Ramya, Sujata, Ramya, Ramya, and I think Hina is also there. Yeah, could you all please stand up and be recognized and welcome. Hina was a member earlier. She's come back again. So nice. Thank you, Hina. Uh, okay, yeah. Ahina, come. Before they come in, I just want to thank uh, J.U. for coming and teaching Batata Vada to my chefs yesterday. Sorry, Vada Pao. And uh, someone taught them a little bit of Parsi cooking. Who came in J.U. yesterday? Or I think uh, I think Sujata sent the recipe and you got in something else. Okay, guys, taste all that because the food is very different today. And we've taken, you know, some tips from the books also and we will try to incorporate that, yeah? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I took a break from the Duchess for five years because I was teaching at a school, like I said. And when uh, I approached uh, Anu, she was more than happy to have me back. And now that I have a little bit of time on me, and I'm glad this is the first event I attended. It's always very uh, exciting to come here because you bring in, bring in speakers and guests who teach us a lot of stuff. And there's so much learning to do in life. And uh, Betsy, I'm happy to be here and uh, hope to have a good journey with all of you. Sorry. Uh, my full name is Hina Nandani Palaniwil. Hi all, uh, my name is Ramya Raman. I'm an architect and uh, it's wonderful, you know, to be a part of this uh, group. And um, I just connected shortly yesterday with Tati and she just quickly had me over today and I'm super excited to uh, be more part of a lot of these events going forward. Uh, thank you, thank you again. Good afternoon, Duchess Divas. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, Jagriti Gulecha and Archana Chabri. I don't think she's here today. Thanks for you know, getting me excited to join the Duchess Club. They've always been very motivating. You know, when Manju come and join, you should come and see. Okay, thanks a lot. My name is Manju M. Hinduja, and I curate Handloom Saris. It's an online store and a designer and an artist. So that's all. I'm very glad to be here and look forward to connecting with all of you. Thank you very much. Hamza, over to you for the formal thing. Hi, friends. It's okay. It was very warm and the way you all interacted with all of us, it was really great. And at a young age, Aditi, very multi-talented. And you with all your wonderful memories with your dad, it was very enriching for us. And uh, you have encapsulated the view of the children, one from Chennai, uh, Madras, and, uh, but you went to the rural with your grandmother and uh, from Mumbai and your Chaupati club. It was very, uh, really, uh, very lively talk that you gave us. And you talked about uh, Raji and uh, uh, the other girl who has come as a refugee from Malaya, Ilavarsi. Yeah, did I get it right? Yeah. And then the trials and tribulations of that girl. 
and I think you must have brought it. Let me buy the book and just check it out. And uh, you also about the secret underground radio. Uh, I didn't know about that. And the three kids who helped in because of the club. Uh, that was a good idea. <laughs> and then, and like all these uh, girls said, we all went through that 71, 1971. Uh, we used to put it, uh, carbon sheets on the windows, uh, with the glass windows and uh, stick it up like we were doing something great. <laughs> protecting our uh, India. <laughs> That's what we used to think. And my cousin actually dug uh, something under the Nelika tree, telling these elders don't think about us. We'll all go and hide under that. <laughs> then, of course, he was spanked for that. Yeah. And then uh, this was a real good meeting. Thank you all for coming. And all the new members. Thank you. But uh, like uh, Sharda said, we have to change the syllabus. Uh, and uh, the thing about uh, glorify our leaders also, our people. And yours is a stepping stone, I think. Yeah, I'm a teacher, so I, I teach the children. And when I teach them, my son used to say, Ma, you're too patriotic. It's coming out too strong. They won't understand it. But still, I try to put in a lot of, the same way like a history teacher, okay? Thank you very much, all of you. Ladies, the books are on sale. The books are on sale. So kindly pick up the books and get them autographed by the authors. And thank you, Bala and Kiran, as always. Thank you.